to discuss the importance of the discovery of the broad angled Higgs boson or its likely discovery at CERN, uh, we don't need to discuss so much the fact that it gives masses to particles. We'll come back to that. But the important fact is that it allows us to unify two types of interactions, namely the electroweak, inter uh, the electroweak interaction, uh, that means the electromagnetic interaction on one side and the weak interaction on the other side. The, electro elect uh, sorry, the electromagnetic interaction, uh, we know, of course, this is what is linked to electricity, but is also responsible for the emission of light, radio waves, and so on. For example, if I have here a star, a distant star, it will emit a photon that I can possibly observe here on Earth. And the distance on which this photon can propagate is extremely long. It's uh, billions of light years. The reason uh, this is the photon, the reason this uh, range of interaction is so uh, long is that the mass of the photon, mass of the photon, m is mass of the photon, is simply equal to zero. And a long range force is associated to a massless intermediary, to a massless vector of the interaction. So this is the electromagnetic interaction. Uh, actually, I've said a star, I could have said a proton inside, or, inside the nucleus, and I've said an observer, it could have said an electron. This is the same force which, uh, which is uh, binding the electron to the proton in an atom. And we have this process here. Now, weak interactions we know much less about because they are very discrete, they are extremely weak. They are also extremely short range, up to the point that their range has never been resolved. And for example, let's consider something very similar. This is called, this, uh, in some form of a Feynman diagram, this is just for the, to mention the name. Instead of taking a proton, we take now no, a neutron in, in, inside the a nucleus. The neutron can convert to a proton through the uh, interaction with a vector, which is called now a W instead of a photon. And we'll have here similar particles uh, on the other side. When we look at the graphs, they are exactly the same. Yet the manifestation of the interaction is completely different since we are dealing once with a very long range interaction, here with a very short range interaction. And this short range interaction is characterized by the fact that, that the mass of the W is of the order of 80 times the mass of the proton. That's a very large mass. It took until the 1980s to discover the W at CERN. Now, uh, we have this paradox that we have two interactions which are very similar that we would like to say they are the same, and yet they differ in a major way. And this was the genius of Broad Englert and later Higgs uh, to uh, explain that yet those two forces could stem from the same origin. They could be one thing, which we call the fundamental interactions, the gauge interactions, if you wish, and that the huge difference in mass is just a side effect. It's just some breaking of a sy fundamental symmetry between the interactions. And for example, let, let me imagine that we have some very abstract space where we pull, put here all the interactions. And OK, we look at this space. This is all the interactions. The idea is that in the beginning of the universe, when it was very hot, all interactions were equivalent. They were probably all long range interactions without mass. But then at some moment, this symmetry was broken. And we say this is a spontaneously broken symmetry. What do we mean by that? Well, look at this pencil. It's standing on its head, on its point here. And it's perfectly symmetrical. If I want to write equations, they are perfectly symmetrical in all directions. Yet, when I let go the pencil, it will fall and it will fall in one direction. The solution here has less symmetry than the problem I started with. This is what we call spontaneously broken symmetry. Now, spontaneously break, broken symmetry is what makes the difference between photon and W. And this is at the crux, at the center of the broad angle Higgs mechanism. But I've mentioned the pencil here to do my symmetry breaking. 
And what is the equivalent of the pencil in the broad angular Higgs mechanism? Well, this is precisely the scalar boson or broad angular Higgs particle, which was being sought for. And its very existence, which is now established, at least what we have seen is perfectly compatible with expectations, uh, is a final, uh, you know, it's cherry at the top of the cake, showing that what has been constructed since the, the mid-1960s is finally completely coherent theory. Now, I mentioned mass. I told you that the scalar boson leads to this breaking of symmetry. Uh, in what is this related to mass? First of all, let's forget about some strange saying that the, the scalar boson would be responsible for the mass of all particles. This is simply not true. If we were only relying on the broad angular Higgs mechanism to generate masses in the universe, everybody, every one of us would weigh less than two kilograms, which is clearly, I think, not the case. So uh, yes, it provides mass, but it provides mass specifically to the photon and the W, a small fraction of the mass of the proton, the totality of the mass of the electron. Uh, how can a field, a particle, provide mass to another? Well, imagine that we have to, we have to propagate across a, a dense wood, and the wood would be the scalar particle. Well, instead of going in a straight line, you need to uh, bounce back a few times. That means that your average speed across the wood will be smaller, and a smaller average speed means having a larger mass. And this is just how it happens. 